Uh, we yeah. are about to broadcast live picture. on Facebook and we're about to start recording this event. Um, so please could I ask everybody to... Hello, everybody. <laughs> okay, are we ready to broadcast, Hannah? Just let me know. Can't quite see. Perfect. All right. Good evening, everyone, and a really, really warm welcome to our very first Art for Cheetahs event. So, my name is Laura Dempsey, and I'm from the Cheetah Conservation Fund. Um, and I'm going to be your host for this evening. So tonight's event will run for about an hour and we'll have an extended Q&A session at the end for anyone who wants to chat with the team and ask any questions. We respectfully ask everyone to remain on mute for this evening and you can pop any questions or comments you have in the chat box. Um, and our team members will be on hand to make sure that your questions reach the right person. So this evening's event is uh, with our very own Dr. Jane Galton, uh, Executive Director of the Cheetah Conservation Fund and the renowned wildlife artist, Marianne Bartlett from Art Safari. So tonight we are bringing together artists, or animal lovers, conservationists, give a voice to cheetahs to help end cheetah trafficking. Now, for those of you um, who have attended Art Safari events previously, a very warm welcome. This is going to be an art event with a bit of a difference. So it's a chance to hear all about how we can fight to protect this incredible species of cheetah. And for cheetah fans, who I know there are many of us here tonight, a chance to appreciate this beautiful cat in a whole new way through the medium of art. So this is a free event, but all donations are very, very welcome. Um, if you'd like to make a donation, you can visit our link below or you can hover your phone, your camera phone, just over this QR code and that will take you straight to our donation pages. And while I think of it, thank you so much to everyone who's already generously donated to participate in this evening. We really, really appreciate it. So for tonight's event, uh, we are inviting you to draw with us. Um, and we hope to give you an understanding of the work of CCF UK while Marianne transports you to the plains of Africa and expertly demonstrates drawing techniques um, and painting techniques to realise the grace and the elegance and the magnificence of these beautiful, beautiful endangered cats. Tonight we're going to run two instruction-led drawing sessions with Marianne and then at the very end Marianne will be running a live demo um, using watercolours. So you'll have a chance to see Marianne painting in action. We would like you to draw and paint as much as you like throughout this evening. All you need is a pen and a paper, but of course, if you have other mediums, please feel free to use them. I know there's lots and lots of experienced artists that have joined us this evening. Okay, so tonight we are asking you to also share your artwork. So we hope you'll feel inspired by the talks and presentations this evening because we're going to ask you to join our challenge to collect 300 pieces of cheetah artwork and I'll tell you a little bit more about those shortly. So to open the event and to help provide a bit more context to our work to protect cheetahs from the legal pet trade, I'm going to hopefully present a short video, so fingers crossed the technology works. Okay, here we go. Just check. Right session. All right, let's give this a go.
Okay, fabulous. So hopefully everyone was able to see and hear our video. Uh, we'll also be sharing a link to the video afterwards. So tonight is an art event. So without much further ado, um, I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce you to the wonderful Marianne Bartlett, a travel and wildlife artist and founder of the incredible Art Safari, who has so generously gifted us her time this evening for this special event. So pens and paper and pencils at the ready. We'll hand over to Marianne and if Hannah, if you could spotlight Marianne's screen, that'd be great. Lovely. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So, thanks so much for coming tonight. Um, it's a scary event for me because I never have this many people really watching me um, draw all at once. Um, and I've been persecuting many of you with the speed drawing sketches here at Art Safari while we're not able to travel. Um, and I fully intend to continue doing those um, as, as much as we possibly can, even when travel resumes. Um, so Art Safari is a travel company primarily and has allowed me to and permitted me and lots of other people to travel around the world. <laughs> World and sketch from life um, and to sketch um, cheetahs. Um, I've been able to, to draw cheetahs in many different, uh, different African countries and actually wildlife parks here in the UK as well. So I wanted to take you through a few of my starting exercises that I use when I'm faced with a, a moving animal. And I will be using stills. I've printed out some photographs here so that we can see them. And I'll spend a few, few minutes on each one um, and really take you through those starting exercises. So let me just go over to my other camera and take you to the drawing board. I hope you've got a pencil in your hand. Um, keep The key thing is to keep moving, keep your hand mobile, keep sketching, just scribble and somehow something, you know, get some, move, get some marks down on the page. Um, as Claudia always says, the lines on the paper actually do tell a story and they're part of your journey and it's part of the practice of doing it. So let me just come over to my other board um, and then I can show you, you don't need my phone there. Um, so what I would do first of all is I might actually take a little bit of time studying my animal. I'm looking at the height, I'm looking at the length. Um, in this case he's a pencil long and he's, he's um, three quarters of a pencil high. So already I can actually start to think, well, what kind of a space is this animal going to fit into? Um, and then this already constrains me. It's not going to allow me to, to go off the edge of the page. If it's a live animal also, when it moves, I can continue drawing for longer while I've got my, while I've delineated the space that it's going to go into. Then I might actually want to be finding the shapes within the animal. I might want to be able to, to find where that head is. Um, and say I might, you know, you can, you can think of uh, simple boxes. You can think of all, you know, we're all going to see, see different shapes here. Um, and we might find a semicircle here. We might find a, 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 a longer oblong for the, I hope you can see this, is it yes, dark good. enough? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you might find various different shapes that I can put down on the page and making it quite ge geometric. And I can see there's a, just a turn to the paw there. And all of that actually is very useful information. It stops me wandering off into other, other dimensions or making something up later on. I can put the tail down. Already I might actually go out of my box, but that's okay too. Um, but then there's other things to consider as well. There are my shapes and I could draw the whole of my animal on this um, by using just the basic shapes. Or I could look at what's happening in the different angles. I could look at that lovely backbone and really kind of consider how far that backbone goes as it slopes over the tail and down the tail. Um, and I'm also looking at the articulation. I know my hip joint is in here. I know that the, the, the pelvis is here, my backbone is here, coming up to where the ear is. And I can then almost start to think about where my eye is and where the, the strongest markings are. And quite quickly, I can 
put the relationship between the ear, the eye and the nose down. And of course, then that lovely teardrop that comes down and creeps around the face to the mouth. So it's the only, only cat that has got that marking. Um, and then as well, I might also, I, many of you have heard me talk about the straight lines and thinking about where my angles are. How am I going to really kind of find the, the angles that really help make this a, a real animal? And knowing at all times that this, this, this creature, this beautiful, beautiful creature might decide to leave us and disappear. Um, it's obviously got something in its sights. It may want to, to, to move. And I haven't committed myself entirely on those first marks. So actually I can start to move some of my lines about in this second phase. I can hear wonderful scribbling from somebody. It's probably you, Hannah. <laughs> and then also notice what's happening, the negative shapes that are happening. We've got a, almost a, a, a sort of M shape here. So you can also look at that M shape if you want to. And bearing in mind, this is before we've put any spots on, but we've got something that's actually relatively, relatively um, cheetah-like. Um, then of course, once you do put the spots on, it's going to make a big difference. But maybe before getting involved in all those delicious spots, think about where the darkest areas are. Um, so the top of the body is quite a lot darker. You've also got a bit of shadow happening. And all of this helps with the volume that we're looking at. We're turning this animal into a three-dimensional creature and we're looking at it, uh, sorry, into two dimensions on the page. And we're looking at it quite carefully. We've taken that time to study and compose and look at those extra little angles. And then, then we can get involved in some of the detail. So each cheetah might have up to 3,000 spots each, so I'm really, really not going to get too involved in the spots. However, I can delineate a little bit. I can be a little bit more careful about where the eye is and can work my way around these areas. And I can smooth, I can um, break my line around the edge. The black hair, by the way, on a cheetah is longer than the the um, the yellowish the yellowish hair, so it does actually seem to have a little bit of a black halo. So we've got that black marking behind the ear, and as I say, just creep around and allow those spots to creep around the body. And um, now at this point, I think it's my turn to hand over and allow our CAO to, um, to have a go, but you might just find that while she's talking, you keep your hand mobile. I'm sure she's going to show us lots of pictures. And I also will be adding my spots. Just notice the way the spots flow over the body. I'll keep my screen on this one um, and you can always find ways of getting to mine. But anyway, just, see whether you can go do two or three thousand spots while we're talking <laughs> well so let me hand over um and then i can continue this on the next section but keep going with those spots because that's what's going to really make it make it work as a cheetah lovely how's that thank you so much marianne that's absolutely wonderful um, I'm really looking forward to seeing everybody's drawings. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our wonderful colleague, the fabulous Dr. Jane Galton, our UK Executive Director, Board Member and Tutor Expert, to really help you all understand why we are seeking to raise awareness and why we need your funding and support so critically to help to end cheetah trafficking. So I'll hand over to Jane. And if you have any questions or comments for Jane, you can pop um, your um, questions in the chat box. So over to Jane. Oh, Jane, you're just on mute. 
Mute. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Ben. Thank you so much, Laura, and thanks everyone. Thank you for being with us tonight. Just, uh, I just want to give you a quick background on the Cheetah Conservation Fund. It was set up about 31 years ago by Dr. Laurie Marker with uh, the headquarters in Namibia. Um, but we work throughout Africa. And as you saw in the video, the cheetah is now the most, um, sadly, the most endangered big cat in Africa with less than 7,500 left. And the main threats are conflict with humans, farmers, and destruction of their habitat, um, loss of prey species, and the illegal pet trade. And it's the illegal pet trade that I'm going to talk about um, very briefly. So um, uh, about 300 cheetah cubs a year are taken from the wild in the, we think mainly in the Horn of Africa. And there you'll see from the map where they're trafficked up to the um, Arabian Peninsula to feed the demand for pets as status symbols. And if you, we, it's best to put this into context. So if you think about 300 cubs being taken a year and there are only 500 adult cheetahs left in the Horn of Africa, you can see that there are serious, serious, serious risk of local extinction. And we think the majority have taken from Ethiopia and then moved through Somaliland, but about 80% die before they reach um, the Arabian Peninsula. And once there, most don't survive past two years because their owners don't really know how to take care of them. So, so going through Somaliland, the Somaliland government started confiscating um, cubs and cheetahs from poachers in about 2016, but they didn't really know how to take care of them. And because we've been working in the region, monitoring the trade for many years, they knew about us. So they asked CCF to provide advice for nine cheetahs they had in their care in 2017. Um, and then more and more were confiscated by the government. And so CCF stepped in to provide proper care and facilities. You can see, um, you can see from the photos that many arrive in a really desperately, desperate situation. They're malnourished, deeply traumatized, and um, it's very sad to see them like that. Um, we built the first cheetah safe house in the capital of Somaliland in 2019 and I actually went there for a while to help build the vet clinic and develop protocols for care and look after the cheetahs. Um, when I was there, there were about 29. Um, we then built another two, two safe houses um, and that sadly the numbers have gone up and we're now taking care of 54 cheetahs and one leopard. Um, and you can see um, you can see the uh, what the um, the first safe house looked like, and then the next slide will show you when it was built. Um, these enclosures where the the cheetahs can actually run around. They have a relatively good amount of space to run around in. Um, so in the next slide, you can see that there are international and Somaliland vets taking care of some of the cubs in our vet clinic. And fortunately, we're now allowed to save, we can save many of these cheetahs. So if you look at the photo, there was, a, there was a, um, a photo in the video of these three cubs in a box. Um, and the, these are the three brothers looking very healthy and happy and basking in the sun. So that's a very uplifting photograph. And they're now, oh goodness, they must be now two years old now. So but because we're taking care of them, we're saving so many more. The downside is, is that we have many more mouths to feed and care for. And uh, the Somaliland government, um, unfortunately, provides no funding. So I should make it clear that this is not what CCF wants to do. We want to keep cheetahs in the wild, but in contrast to the illegal trade in products such as ivory and rhino horn, we have to deal with the output of confiscations, which is the live animals. Um, so, but we're also working to reduce supply as well as demand of these cubs. Um, what we're doing as well is we're adapting our conservation program developed in Namibia for this region. Um, the next photograph will show the training we conducted in January this year, training Ethiopian and Somaliland vets. So they know how to take care of cheetahs at the point of confiscation and can also help us in the vet clinics. 
We're educating school children to understand the value of cheetahs and wildlife for their ecosystem. And we're reaching community leaders and members in Somaliland and Ethiopia to educate them about the need to conserve wildlife, um, as well as allowing us to have a better understanding of the trade and the routes used. Um, Laurie actually um, visited 62 villages in February and met up with about 700 community leaders and members. So we are hoping to repeat that in, in other parts of the country. We've also reviewed laws relevant to wildlife with some gap analyses and we're building capacity in law enforcement. And we've also just literally been asked by um, some of the governments in the Horn of Africa to write their wildlife laws. Well, partnering, obviously, we're not going to do that. We're going to partner with some legal, our legal partners. So that's a huge undertaking, but such a positive step that they have actually recognised the need for that. And they're asking us to get involved. And there is hope. Um, we've been given um, 40,000 hectares of land by the Somaliland government to build a cheetah, CCF Cheetah Rescue and Conservation Centre, and that's going to form part of the first national park in Somaliland. We've got uh, plans, we've now got to raise the funds to build it. And then, of course, um, we look forward to the time when we can actually release the cheetahs in the, from the safe houses into their new center, which will just be amazing. Hopefully by, I don't know, this year, next year. Um, and then of course we have ongoing work in reducing supply and demand, and that's very important in the region. But unfortunately in the meantime, we have to take care of these beautiful animals in our care. Um, so any donations and support are very welcome. Um, it takes about 10 pounds to feed three cheetah cubs, che cheetahs for the day. Um, camel, donkey, mainly camel actually in Somaliland. I think there's donkeys in there somewhere, but it's mainly camel. And, um, and you can sponsor a cub for any amount and also um, any amount um, generally more expensive to provide veterinary care for the cubs. Um, but I hope that gives you a good overview. Um, and thank you so much for your time and uh, please help us take care of these beautiful animals. Thank you. Okay, I wanted to take you back to this drawing which I've been carrying on doing some spots on. And you can see I, I'm, I've carried on diddling around on the spots which do take quite a long time to put down. Um, and um, then I thought, well, actually, maybe I need to get rid of that original box. So I, rather than take my rubber, why don't I take, um, a, this is, happens to be a water-soluble pencil. So I can actually bring in some kind of indication of a background here to just to disturb the eye from that original box um, and see as well what happens if I put, um, some colour or, or some uh, indication of tone over the cheetah itself. So just bring a, bring a bit of sky colour in here or sky tone, slightly to make it a scene, yes, but, and actually I can see that if I do that, it'll disappear. So why don't I just spray it a little. The, the, a water spray and water soluble pencil is absolutely lovely. Um, and then you can still move the pigment around slightly just to strengthen up some areas and to loosen others. So there, just focusing on the tail, you know, those lovely ring bars on the tail um, that are so identifiable and actually do identify each cheetah. Um, and there, when the pigment is wet, I can just strengthen up around the eye and the nose. And we've probably got enough information down there. Um, and it, the, the, the effect of the spray is just loosens the pigment on the page and, and, um, and strengthens it. So there I would probably leave that one as it is. But I wanted to take you back to this idea of the backbone because a backbone of a cheetah is so, so identifiable. You can see a backbone from a cheetah. It just couldn't be anything else. It's this look the, from the head over that shoulder to the body, sorry, down the, down the pelvis and down the tail. And of course the tail that has got off the bottom of the page because then you can build your animal 
absolutely you could almost build the animal underneath here use finding that m shape finding the strength of the shoulder that fairly short neck this this one happens to be um, looking quite far forward um, and then finding where the tail goes where's it going and finding your animal it's this shoulder which is so important so i wanted to take you now to another image let's throw that one away um, and take you actually to the bone structure itself um, and once we look at them, we all know that cheetahs run at 70 miles an hour, 112 kilometers an hour, and, but not many people know that a snail, this was for Rob Ward if he's here, um, not many people know that a snail moves at 0.032 kilometers an hour. So if, if we're looking at this articulation, this is, what how, this is how a cheetah moves so, so beautifully and, and elegantly it's liquid, this backbone just moves and it's entirely, entirely unique to, to the, the cheetah. Um, they, so if I were to draw that backbone, you'll see very quickly we get into <laughs> this. <laughs> There's a comment there. <laughs> so, so you can see how this shape again is going to turn into cheetah. I'm looking at this skeleton here. I'm looking at the bone structure. Look at that pelvis, how far back it is. Look at the length of um, the body and that huge shoulder blade, huge shoulder blade. It's very, very useful to look at the skeletons. There are plenty of examples on them of them on the internet. Um, but also very useful to just study them and look and think about your own arm movements. You know, we're, we're actually looking at our own limbs here and look at the length of that hand going back, this foot coming forward. Um, just really handy to see all of that for it being put together. Um, and then of course the, the, the head there. And then it's not all that difficult to see how you would move. I'll leave that up in case some of you are drawing it, but it's not all that difficult to see how you can move into a live animal. So let me then clothe this animal with its fur. Um, I'm referring to this one. It's obviously not in exactly the same picture. This is a uh, position, but this is a picture that Alison took and sent to me. The, the, my cheetah um, pictures tend to be um, quite static, oh, not, not always static actually, but I'm often drawing in Namibia um, and I am very, very lucky in that I have spent a lot of time with the CCF in um, various different um, uh, cheetah conservation um, reserves um, and so very often I um, have taken people to draw and paint in very, very special conditions um, from the animals that have been rescued. And I'm just concentrating a little bit on the nose, finding that eye, that, that teardrop there creeps around the mouth. And that beautiful, beautiful cat mouth. This one, terribly alert, it's on the chase small, small ears there. Do tell me if my head gets in the way. <laughs> and then look at that strength of the shoulder coming down. And I'm, I'm merging this image and that to find that shoulder um, and to find where this second foot is. I'm actually going to use this position of that second foot, front leg, and just look how long these limbs are. When we're drawing them from life, it's incredibly difficult because these, these cheetahs are um, purring at your feet. Um, they, they domesticate incredibly well, which is why um, they're very popular in the pet trade. Um, and um, but just look at this nice articulation here. Apparently, Akbar the Great had... I'm just coming coming over. Do you see this this 
um, the shoulder blade there, this is what creates that great big bump. And the bump has got very long fur on it. So we're going to break up that lump in the end by the fur. And you can see how the animal is coming together. And I'm going to move its tail, swing its tail around artistic license. And somehow I need another foot there, don't I? Another back foot. I can swing this around here. So there's a little bit of artistic license, as I say, as this animal is moving forward here. And you can see how that, those lovely round cheeks. And this is before we've even got to putting any spots on. And the spots, again, will go over my original drawing. I'm just going to strengthen up some of the some of the limbs here. And you can really play with the angles. You can really find where the 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 um the different parts of the, the limbs are. We can see we come over the toes, over the well fingers actually, over the wrist here and into the body, in towards the body, sorry. And then just to help me, I'm going to find some of those spots. And what's lovely, of course, the same as when you're drawing people and um, they're drawing, they've, they've got elaborate fabrics on, some of those spots will be half, won't they? They become, they're creeping around the, the body. Um, and so just keep your pencil mobile over the whole of the picture. Um, we're, we're, um, we haven't got a, um, a cheetah, actually here in the studio with me. I actually find it so much easier to draw from life than from photographs. I think there's an energy that happens when you're drawing from life that is almost irreplaceable. Don't forget the little eyebrows there. And they're very dark over the brow. They've got this, this great big brow that, that actually kind of can make them look a little bit cartoony. But then again, find your shadows, find the dark, find those tones and scribble in. And hopefully I haven't gone too much over time. Um, I'm just going to find some of those nice darks. I've got a leg appearing that's got to come through here. And again, think of your own limbs as you're putting it together. And I will continue to draw a few more spots on this um, while our next little interlude happens. Um, and you can see how these spots will actually start to really create even more energy around the piece. Um, and as you break the line, your original line, you'll get more speed. And if there's more movement around, isn't that wonderful? Because that's what's going to create even more movement. And you can use the foliage behind to do that as well. So, Laura, do I hand back to you now? Yes, thank you. That's absolutely beautiful. It's just magical to watch in action. Thank you very much, Marianne. Okay, so on to our next section. So, we hope that you will all feel really inspired. Now you've understood a little bit more about the threats facing, as Jane said, up with the most endangered big cat. We hope you've been inspired to share your creations with us. We want to bring together 300 pieces of cheetah artwork to represent the 300 cubs that are taken from the wild in the Horn of Africa every year for the illegal pet trade. So we will be asking you to share your drawings and you can share your drawings that you've created tonight or actually if you feel inspired to get painting and drawing afterwards you'll have until the end of june to submit your drawings so um we are asking you primarily we'd love you to share your drawings on social media because that really helps to raise awareness and reach as many people as possible so please do post your drawings you can use any of the channels twitter facebook instagram linkedin please make sure that you're tagging us otherwise we won't be able to see them so to tag us is at ccf um, cheetah uk 
and we'll put these in the chat box as well. We're using two hashtags as well, so end cheetah trafficking and hashtag 300 cheetahs. And that just helps to really spread the message far and wide. If you're not on social media um, or don't want to upload them yourself, that's no problem. You can also email your drawings to us at artforcheetahs at cheetah.org.uk. And of course, if some of your cheetahs reach the art safari pages, that's absolutely fine. Mary Ann's team can share them with us. So um, we're showing you a couple of examples. Here's some images we've borrowed from Google. So we want to create an online gallery of these beautiful images. But we're also asking our young supporters to get involved as well. So here are some drawings created by our, our, young, um, our young cubs. Um, so we ran a crafty cheetahs competition for children last year and you can see some of the beautiful creations. So this really is for all ages, for all abilities to join them. Fabulous. So we're also asking you all to support the wider campaign. The campaign, as I said, is um, running until the end of June. We're going to tell you a little bit more about how you can support this campaign. But in a moment, I'm going to hand back um, to Mary Ann to show you some watercolours in action, if that's all right with you, Mary Ann. That's great. That's great. And uh, Laura, the other thing's uh, quite nice for everybody to know is I will share these pictures to the Art Safari Facebook page and then you can share them to, um, to your pages so that you've got the same photographic references that I've got. Because um, that, that's quite useful because I know some of, most of you have been, been drawing quite quite busily um, for the last little while. And when you've got the photograph in front of you, it's then really good to be able to see uh, to see that the, the claws are extended. And there's lots of sort of cheetah facts that are actually included in this, in these, these photographs. So is there anything you want to say, Laura, or shall I just? Yeah. I, if you're happy to start the watercolors and I'll ask you a couple of questions, unless you'd like a, a second. And no, that's all good. That's all good. Um, I just wanted to sort of point out um, how I've continued um, moving on here and I've continued to, to put in some of those two to three thousand spots um, while while Laura has been talking. Um, and I've also tried to identify where some of where some of the absolute shadows are. It's not really until this point that I'm ready to put the pupils of the eyes in. Very often on a cheetah, you won't ever see the pupils and nor will you necessarily see the eye color. The eye color on a cheetah is very rich, very orange. It's a beautiful, beautiful color. Um, and it's, it's, but often you'll only see it in low light. But just see how you can carry on sketching. You don't have to have quite as much of a mess of, of legs as me, um, but it's quite good fun when you when you just pick something that's absolutely incredibly difficult to draw because in a way it stops you getting um, caught up in in a cliche because many of us would want to um, say oh okay I want to be able to do a perfect a perfect cheetah portrait but actually why not do something that's that's a bit more challenging for your own artistic development so I wanted to go on now to a uh, to another, I don't know why I do it to myself, but I thought I would, I would <laughs> take you to this drawing, which again, um, Alison sent me. Um, so it is new to me as an image, which is always quite a challenge. And many of you know, know the difficulty of those having those new images thrown at you the whole time. Um, but that's what's going to make you a better wildlife artist. That's what's going to make you really appreciate how much you need to do out in the wild. I'm just having a dither about which paper to use. I think actually now I will go on to watercolour paper. So I'm going to use a watercolour paper. Can you still see the image? Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. And I'm going to try to contain myself into a smaller area, which would then mean I can crop afterwards. So I'm going to try to con contain my image into this part of the paper. And then I think for this, I will actually take up a pencil to just make sure that I don't disappear off the, 
off the site side. I know I can see here that it's wider than it is tall. So already I'm, I'm kind of measuring up. I'm thinking I need one and a half space to height. Um, and that's going to be a tricky, a, a tricky one straight away. And I really want to use that piece of page, that piece of the page. But if I try to keep myself contained, I'm not showing pencil lines on the back of one. No, I shall. I'll, I'll try to to um, get my pencil marks a little bit darker as I go in. Thanks, Claudia. Um, and um, keep my cheetah lined in this area um, here. And I'm just going roughly at the moment. Just want to find the face, find the angles. So I'm actually kind of really even even using my pencil along the angle. You can see I'm just using a very- You can't see him yet. You can't see him yet, okay. I will go a little bit harder. And I'm just finding those angle, angles. This looks to me like a very young cheetah. Mary Ann, could you tell us a little bit about the background to Art Safari? What inspired you to set it? Oh, <laughs> yes, um, I, I went to Africa for the first time in, um, in 1991 um, to, to follow the footsteps of my great-great-grandfather who was a, an explorer and I went with a cousin and a team from Cambridge University um, and I was the artist in residence on that expedition. Um, and um, fell in love with Malawi particularly, which actually has a wonderful um, history with cheetahs. I've just had a re reintroduction. Um, and um, fell in love with Malawi. And then, um, then I've, I have carried on going ever since, but in 99 went to Malawi to spend six months there and found the idea for Art Safari and to take people traveling to Africa and to paint from life, to paint animals from life. So here I've got a, 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 a very basic drawing. I don't know how much of it you can actually see. Some of it. See Some of it. Yeah. At the moment, to me, the, 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 the face might look a little bit big. Um, but I can probably adapt that as I go. And I may need to spread either way. Um, I'm just going to pick up a paintbrush and paint as if I, as if I was out in the bush. So um, out, often out in the bush, I will take these, um, these water pens, which are fabulous to use. And it does just mean that you can sketch terribly lightly and you can find your animal. Um, <laughs> of course, picked one up that's a bit blocked. But anyway, I can pick up the animal here. This 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 picture looks very much to me as if it's a Kenyan cheetah. It's very red earth. Am I right, Alison? She's on mute. Um, but we've got this very red red looking cheetah. And when I'm out in the bush, I may well be painting in a very, very loose way with one of these, just trying to get some information down, any information down, um, not really minding too much, just scrubbing at the page in a very unwatercolory way. You'll know that if you're a watercolor, you spend uh, watercolorist, you tend to spend an absolute fortune on brushes, but actually when you're out in the field, why not use one of these they're very inexpensive and you can just scrub away and find your paints. And I may well. Um, they've got a reservoir of water. They have got a reservoir of water. So I tend to keep three or four of these in a, two or three of these in a pocket. And then I, I can squeeze the water out to um, create, to, to find my paint. So that's one of my, the, the ways I would sketch in the wild. I am, while I'm here going to, put actually let's just find a bit more paint on there 
those lovely red eyes that we were talking about, why not put those in here? Because I think it might help your reading of, of the image. Um, and then I can also come in with straight away with a darker color that will bleed into it. And what are your, I guess, we've probably got all got our favorite aspects of why we love cheetahs. What, what is it for you, Marianne, that you love so much about cheetahs? They purr. <laughs> they purr, they make an enormous, enormous noise. And they will, they just love being with you. Um, and actually you'll hear the wild ones purring as well. Um, but out in, if you're in a rescue center and you've got animals near you, which um, if you're lucky enough, you can happen. Um, yeah, you hear them purring and they just make such a racket, it's wonderful. Um, so that, that I would say is definitely one of my favorite things about cheetahs. Um, so I'm just gonna put the eyes in. Normally I would put the eyes in at the very last minute, um, but, but actually, I think it really does help with the, the reading of the sketch. And there you can see where the, where the paint is still a little bit wet on the page. I can bring in some of the dots and they will slightly blur. And actually, I'm going to accentuate that a little bit more. Bring my water over. Where's my big brush? There we go. There we go. I've hidden it for myself. And I am going to, to put a bit more water onto the page um, to so, so that things blur a little bit more than they are, because actually we want this cheetah to look not only serious, but um, but a little bit a little bit furry. Um, and hopefully I haven't done too much, and I'm going to drop in some of that nice red of the earth because we want that dust and if you're a, a splatterer then why not bring the splatter in at any time you can have it while it's on the brush um, and um, always useful for extra extra movement and then I'm also going to bring in some of the color the actual color of a cheetah underneath those lovely yellows. And hopefully you're all sketching as well. And while this is wet, I can drop in more of those blacks. I'm going to pick up a slightly bigger brush now to be able to do that. And if you're painting in a hurry, don't worry about using black or not using black. Um, if you want to mix your blacks, there are lots of lovely recipes to do that. But actually, why not um, just create, you know, you can pick up, you can pick up the black, any of the indigos, any of those nice colours, and you can see how it moves nicely into the wet of the page. Uh, it's probably a little bit too wet. I was going to try. This is the thing you, you really, really want to work quite slowly on watercolor paper if you can. But we've only got another five minutes of painting. So perhaps I put a little bit too much paint water on the page here. And I'm trying not to obsess about the chin and all of that, but why don't I bring in a little bit of dark behind there. And then I'm picking up as thick an amount of paint as I possibly can. And where it's all glistening wet there, it won't spread too much, I hope, if I um, have got a really, really dense amount of paint on my brush. So we're just moving the, the spots in, just putting some of those spots in. I've made it quite a serious looking cheetah here. Um, I probably would will come in a little bit later and do a tiny bit more. 
Um, Mary Ann, for those new to drawing, to painting, what's your advice for those starting out and maybe a little bit nervous? <laughs> <laughs> Just do lots of it. Do lots and lots. It's the more practice you can do, the better. Um, and it, it's not actually about the finished result because, um, you know, you, you'll see something here which will look will approximate a cheetah and it'll look roughly, roughly like a cheetah ish. But, you know, when I started doing doing wildlife, I'm not sure any of it looked like the right animal. Um, so so it's it's a matter of just having a having a go, not not feeling as if it's got to be absolutely perfect every time because they won't be. Um, and it's actually just fun to look and it's all about learning how to observe. It's not actually about how to learn how to make your perfect picture because most of us would pick up a camera for that. Um, but actually to learn how to look is just absolutely amazing to do. Um, and I think any anybody who's been on art safari with us as, and any of our tutors um, would absolutely support that idea that it is phenomenal to learn how to observe and also to learn how to teach people how to observe. You you feel like you're 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 almost learning a complete new language, um, and your eyes are are opened, if you like. So there we have our, our cheetah just building up slowly. Um, and I can see, I want to, I've lost his ear, haven't I? Thank you. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's not got wet. This one. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, and it's that, mm, it's that lovely kind of you it's very nice to find that furriness mm. and you know they they're quite serious they look quite scary they're they're they can be almost as tame as a as a dog but they can also look incredibly scary and i can just pick up a tiny bit of paint on the back of my brush and try to try to create an indication of the whiskers now of course our whiskers are white on a on a cheetah, but um, for purposes of picture, why not make them darker? Um, and just finding a little bit more highlight and finding a little bit more action in the ears. And down the nose. And possibly finding a bit more depth and dark on that eye and on this one. And I think it just comes to life when you do that a little bit more. The, the spots you'll see are all in the wrong place. I'm not worried about it, um, even though you're all watching. <laughs> and I may well bring a little bit more splatter in there um whatever color happens to be on my brush at the same at that moment um as well as probably want to bring in a bit more of a, a darker darker amount of dust here and we've got a huge amount of action coming now this isn't an accurate drawing it really doesn't matter that it's not it it's it's not entirely accurate but I can, I can kind of feel my, my way into the energy of the piece and I can enjoy this moment of, that I've spent with you and I've got a memory of that, of that moment here on the page. So that's probably where I would, I would probably come into this a little bit later um, and well, maybe I can manage it now. Just find a few more spots because there's very, very indicative spots that come down from the eyes. Now I've been terribly, terribly lucky and I have spent a lot of time with cheetahs. Um, and they are adorable creatures, much, much more um, 
in a way I well I do I like them much more than I like the, the, the lions lions are just a bit wasteful in what they happen to kill um, as I say this is a fairly young cheetah I think just very very soft around its ears and probably probably about about all I need to do on that um, I, I could carry on fiddling and as we know fiddling is never very very good for a picture so there we are so I hope you'll all give a go give that a go I will put these images up on uh, our Facebook page on the Arts Fari Facebook page as well as Alison you'll you'll put this it up onto yours as well um, onto the Cheetah Conservation UK pages it'll go onto Instagram as well it's been fabulous to draw and paint with you um, of course when this is over you when this is um, all dried you could rub out your pencil marks they'll all pretty much disappear you could go back in and put some background in if you want to but it would be lovely to see all of your artwork um, hope you have enjoyed being with us and um, I'll come back to my own camera so you can see me for two seconds before we let you go um, but thank you and thank you to the Chiefs Conservation Fund for asking me to to come and demonstrate for you. Um, it's been, I've been terrified <laughs> to paint in front of you all, um, but um, otherwise, um, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Marianne, that was absolutely perfect. Thank you so, so much. And if you could hear, if we hadn't made everyone hear a big round of applause. So thank you so much to the bottom of our heart. Mm -hmm. um, so we're nearly at the end of our event. Just have a couple mm -hmm. of minutes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Please continue to keep yourself in the meat. Um, oh, so I'm going to share my screen now. Um, one person in my meeting. Thank you ever so much. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about sharing your artwork. There are actually um, three ways we would really love for you to help us to make a difference. So we're asking everyone to take part in our campaign. We're asking everyone to raise awareness. As, as Jane has described, the numbers are critical. This is a really, really dire situation. As Mary Ann's described, these are the most beautiful animals and they can be really easily domesticated. And so sadly, that means they're being taken from the wild as pets. So we are asking you um, to help us in three ways to donate and to sponsor our rescued cubs that are out in Somaliland. So as Jane mentioned, you don't have to give a huge amount, just as little as five pounds a month makes a massive difference. You can use this QR code here, or you can visit this link and Lorraine will pop that link in the chat box again. You can join our online cheetah coalition. So we are all over social media platforms. So please do join us across Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and really help to share, like, and comment everything we're doing because that helps us reach so many more people. And then finally, you can take part in our event. So we have a sporty racing event coming up in a few weeks for those of you that are keen on getting running. Um, but we also have a follow on art event, which Marianne is very kindly hosting for us again. So this will be a three hour event dedicated to drawing, sketching, painting cheetahs. So it'll be much more focused, even more focused on the art. It will run for three hours on Saturday the 19th of June. Uh, the cost of the tickets is £35 per person with proceeds going towards our cheetah conservation work. And there's a link you can use um, just on the screen here. And again, we'll pop that in the chat box for you to book your tickets. Okay, so... Uh, we also would love to promote the work of Marianne and the absolutely wonderful Art Safari. So if you've enjoyed tonight and you're new to the world of Art Safari, you can visit Marianne's beautiful website and hear about all the other events and projects that they're running to take part in. And finally, just to end, so we, we've seen some of these cheetahs and one you may recognise at the bottom of the screen. So these are some of our, as Jane said, older cheetahs in Namibia who've been released into protected areas and they have freedom, they have them much closer to their natural habitats. And although the pet trade is really harrowing and it is disturbing as someone mentioned in the chat box, 
So if you're support, it's not too late um, and the future really can be much brighter. So we are asking you all to donate, to share your artwork and join our campaign and really help us to provide lifetime care for orphaned, abandoned and confiscated cheaters to help us provide um, veterinary treatment. And then really, really crucially, um, to um, support our preventative work to end the brutal illegal wildlife trade. So we wanted to say um, a massive, massive, massive thank you to the wonderful Marianne for gifting us her time this evening. A huge, huge thank you to Jane, uh, an enormous thank you to Alison, who's really helped to put all of this event together, and to all of the CCF UK team who've helped us, of which pretty much nearly all of them are volunteers. So thank you so much to our wonderful team. Uh, that brings us to the close of our event, but we're staying online for another 15 minutes in case um, you wanted to um, hear how some of the questions are being answered that you've been adding into the chat box. So for those of you that would like to stay on, please do. Um, this event is being recorded and it is being broadcast on Facebook, so it will be available afterwards if you want to rewatch or if you want to share it with your friends and family. Uh, we also have a link to our newsletter, so we'll share that if you want to sign up and continue to hear about our work. So uh, without much further ado, then I'm going to hand over to Nareed, who's going to host our Q&A section. And I'll uh, wish farewell to everyone who's heading off now. Um, so do feel free to stay on if you'd like to join the Q&A. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for um, joining us this evening and, and all your lovely questions that have come in. Um, so we're just at the starting from the sort of the beginning there uh, with a question for Jane, actually. Um, Sarah wanted to know, um, where are the cubs released in Ethiopia? Let me just read out. I've already responded on the chat box, but Thank I'll you. read it out now. Okay. Um, the, the, basically, the cubs that are confiscated in Somaliland can't be released. They can't be rewilded. Um, they're too young when they arrive, and they um, cubs generally need to be with their mother for at least. Oh, we get away with nine months, but you know, preferably a year before they can then learn how to hunt properly. So of course, when they come into um, our care in Somaliland, we have to feed them. So then they get very accustomed to humans and they've also not had the training from their mother. So the photo in the slideshow was actually taken from our rewilding project in Namibia. And it's there we get cheetahs in because the main reason we have cheetahs in Namibia in our care is because of human wildlife conflict, not the pet trade. So the ones that are coming in, sometimes they're a bit older. So we keep them, if they're six or seven, eight months older, we keep them well, well away from the main center. And then those are released into a protected landscape. So in Somaliland, as you can see, the safe houses are not the ideal situation for cheetahs to be in. So we've got this 40 hectare plot of land and the cheetahs will be released into that area, but it's not, they're not going to be wild. They're going to be, there's going to be fences around it. Um, they'll have to be protected. So it's sort of a soft re, a soft rewilding really, but they're not going to be, they're not going to be, they're not going to be completely in the wild. They'll just have a lot more space. So does that answer your question? I think it does. Yes. And apologies. I didn't, I didn't quite see that you'd actually gone ahead and yeah. answered that already in the chat box. Um, there was a question as well, actually, from um, Cassie. Um, and I'm not sure whether Jane, perhaps uh, you know the answer or whether maybe uh, Marianne would know the answer. Um, the question was about the spots, whether they follow a dermatone um, pattern or are they just sort of, you know, random, really. So I don't know if you know the answer to that or maybe Marianne knows the answer. I think they're I think they're random, but you know, Marianne might know better than I. I I believe that they are random, but they and they are mm. unique to that particular animal. Certainly, it's it for identification. You use the tail markings. Um, yeah. Um, if I can just add in, the researchers certainly use um, the side panels a lot and the tail for identification. And normally the left side and the right side are very different, like our fingerprints. You know, we all have individual fingerprints. The cheetah has individual spot patterns. 
Great. Thank you, Alison, Jane, and Mary Ann. Um, there was also a question about the legs. So when a cheetah is running, are the, the legs, the back legs um, outside or inside of the, of the front legs? <laughs> so again, for those maybe who've, who've seen cheetahs in the wild running, perhaps they know the answer. When it's really at full, full speed, um, yeah. and it's trying to really propel itself, then it will certainly bring those back legs sort of right up with the front legs sort of more in. So it's really forcing itself with that extra speed. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really the only time. Otherwise, you'll quite often see as Mary Ann, you know, was drawing is, you know, that backbone is so flexible as well. So it really, those legs, those front legs go out and those back legs really go back mm -hmm. just to get that speed. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so uh, there was a question as well about the brushes, but I think that that's been answered for, for Mary Ann about the, the water brushes that you were using. Um, and I don't know if there's, if there's perhaps um, Alison, maybe you know if, there's, if you have any more information about the size of the cheetah versus a leopard. That was another question that came in as well. They're built for completely different things. So a leopard is much heavier. Um, the cheetah, Alison, is about maximum. They're about, the males generally get up to about 50 kilos. The females mm. are about 40. They're about the same height as leopards, but leopards are 60 to 80 kilos. So they're just much stockier. And, you know, they're, they're, I think at the blade, they're about the same height, but they're much more slender. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and as in, with regard to the tear marks, uh, there, there are some sort of um, African legends, I believe, about how the cheetah got its tear marks. Does anybody know those, uh, think those legends? <laughs> I could tell you all sorts of tall stories, but no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, okay, fantastic. Um, well, I think the most of the questions have, have actually been answered there. There were um, a lot of uh, people saying thank you very much, Mary Ann, for the wonderful session. Um, and it was really, really amazing to watch you actually bring those cheetahs to life on the page for us. So um, if there uh, aren't any further questions, then perhaps we we'll draw our meeting to, a, to a oh, one thing I one, one thing I wanted to just um, mention was um, Hannah talked about the success stories and there are many many success stories so um, human wildlife conflict is being um, addressed in many different countries um, one of the countries that I go to quite regularly is Malawi uh, there they have reintroduced Hello. they've reintroduced cheetahs very successfully um, and those cheetahs have, have cubs this year. And once they start breeding, we anticipate that once, once those cubs are, are, are older, we do anticipate that, we'll, that they will move the gene, gene pool around from the different parks and that the population will grow. And so it's just very encouraging to go to places where conservation, conservation is really working. Thank you, Marianne. We just had one final question, which is coming from Chris. Um, it's probably a, a little bit of a, a sad answer to a question, but um, perhaps Jane might like to answer this one. Um, the question is, when the cheetah cubs are abducted, what happens to the mothers? Um, unfortunately, sometimes they're killed. Um, and either through um, for abduction for the pet trade, but sometimes there's a little bit of human wildlife conflict that happens. So the, the mother's killed and the cubs are left behind. But sometimes they, um, they abduct them when the mother is off hunting. But again, that's going to be incredibly traumatic for the mother because she'll come back and her cubs will have gone. So either way, it's not a very good situation. Mm -hmm. And as I've said before, once a cheetah cub is taken from the wild, that's it. They're taken from the wild. You know, we, it, it's, they're gone forever from the wild. So... We really have to work hard to stop this crisis from, you know, expanding. Otherwise, they're going to be at risk of local extinction in this area. And once they become locally extinct, well, then and and, and if we and if the demand is still there, well, then you can imagine they're going to start going to other countries, mm -hmm. Kenya, Tanzania, um, Sudan, South Sudan. So we really have to nip this in the bud um, so that it doesn't it doesn't start um, decimating other um, populations. Um, mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Thank you very much for that, Jane. I think the message is clear, isn't it? That, um, you know, if you want, if you love cheetahs, um, leave them in the wild. Try not to, you know, don't take them away from their mothers. They're, the cheetah cubs have a, have a fairly difficult time as cubs anyway, don't they, when they're um, in the wild. And um, unfortunately, if we take them away from their mum and dad, then, or their mums, I should say, then unfortunately their, um, their, their chances of survival are very, very slim. So thank you very much. I think the other thing is that they don't breed very successfully in captivity. If it's what they do, very, very rarely do they breed in captivity. And animals that are kept in the con in the in the reserves, um, in the rescue sent rescue reserves, are purposefully not bred in, bred bred from. Um, and that, that's a policy which I fully support. And let's let's have many, many more cheetahs out in the wild. In the whole of sub-Saharan Africa, there should be cheetahs, and let's have them. Wouldn't it be wonderful if they actually reintroduced them into India, where they were um, the last Asiatic cheetahs were were destroyed in the late 1940s, I believe. Yeah, Laurie's in Laurie's in discussion with the Indian government at the moment about reintroducing them. Yeah, so that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Mm. It wouldn't it? And, and cheetahs are so iconic for uh, the Indian culture as well, almost as iconic as, as the tiger. Um, so yeah, would be amazing if they did. Great, thank you. Um, so there was just um, one or two more questions and then I think we're, we've probably come to a natural sort of conclusion. Um, Tre Trevor, I think was asking, um, can orphan cheetahs be matched up with a mother cheetah? So, no. simple question, simple answer, no. Sadly really? not. They have to be brought up by um, by uh, humans, and also all the adult cheetahs we have in Namibia and Somaliland, and I assume in other places, they all they're all neutered. Um, so yeah. Right. All right. Great. Well, thank you very much for all those questions. And um, I think um, as we've sort of come to a natural conclusion to the end of our um, presentation this evening, thank you very much, Marianne. It was just wonderful. Thank you to Jane. Thank you to Laura for, uh, for hosting us. And um, I'll hand back to Laura. She would like to say a fair, farewell. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reid. I'm sorry we didn't get to answer everyone's questions. We'd be very happy to answer them by email. Um, you can drop me your email address in the private chat if you want, and we will respond to your questions that we haven't had a chance to answer today. Um, so we, we have come to the end. Uh, a couple of people have asked if they can show their artwork, so that might be quite a fun way to finish. Um, so what we'll do, if you can unpin me, Hannah, um, I can maybe unpin myself. Um, we'll get everyone to uh, share their show, turn their cameras on and share their cheetah artwork up to their screens. So I just need to unpin myself. You can stay on mute though. Okay, can we see some of this artwork? Wonderful, beautiful. Oh, pretty fantastic. Oh, look at all of that. Wow. 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 Oh, well done, everybody. Oh, it's just, oh, fabulous. Oh, look at the films. Really good. Thank you. It's amazing in such a short time what people can do. Oh, it's amazing. You've been practicing really hard. These <laughs> are just wonderful. I'm really not going to show mine. No, uh, I'm not showing mine. It's <laughs> the yeah. no Oh, goodness. Oh, Alice, really well done. Wow. Oh, Alice, multiple cheetahs. Alice, that's gorgeous. Gorgeous, right? We definitely, definitely need to be sharing these across our social media. Please, please. Send yeah. Them. Really good. Kathy, the girl in Pensacola. Really, really good. <laughs> you are such a rock star, Marie. Really. <laughs> <laughs> and Maxine's, my goodness. Can't wait to see these tomorrow. Mm. I will post these up onto Facebook um, and, and then um, Hannah or, or Alison will share them across to, to the CCS pages. Definitely, definitely. We, we must share them to everyone. I'm, I'm really impressed with what people yeah, have done. Keep, keep sketching, keep moving your paintbrush in your hand and your hand and your pencil and let it all fly around the page. You can't, I can't tell you how, for some reason, <laughs> 
painting in front of you. <laughs> really, really fun to be able to do it. And can't wait to see you next week. Those of you who would like to, um, Claudio is coming and going to be in the spotlight here um, talking about, well, we'll tell you about, we'll tell you about, about that. So we'll tell you about that later, but um, come to the Art Safari pages and we'll tell you about it. Thank you, Laura. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Thank you so much, Marianne. Thank you to everyone so much for joining and for your donations and all of your support. Um, and we look forward to seeing many of you again at the next event. Take care, everyone. Thank Bye. you, everybody. <laughs> Thank Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Have a good evening. Thanks. Bye-bye.